Robert, welcome to the eighth annual Culture Shifting Week in Silicon Valley, albeit virtual. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. For the room that's watching this video, uh, Robert is a former uh, awards honoree um, several years ago when we did this in New York. So it's a pleasure to have him back. He's a friend. He's an ally, a racial equality ally, as most people know, and uh, somebody I'm proud to call call a friend. So, uh, Robert, let's uh, let's jump right in sure. with our first question. Mm -hmm. um, so. Do you believe that we can tackle systemic change in our lifetime? And if so, how? Yeah, I, the short answer is yes. And again, thank you all for being here and just being part of what is uh, the movement of progress and equality uh, in this country. And you know, the answer to this really lies in you know, rooms like this uh, where people are committed to putting the effort uh, and being intentional about our actions. And look, not all of them are gonna be popular, not all of them are going to be accepted, not all of these actions are, are gonna be received well by the institutions or people, quite frankly, who can help us address some of the systemic inequities that exist in our society, uh, but we have to push. Um, and we will make these changes. And, you know, and I, I am encouraged every day, I just got off um, the, uh, I, I do a, monthly call with, with the Morehouse 2019 class. And I have one of my good friends, John Newtendall, as a guest speaker this week. Uh, and some of the work that they're doing at Bank of America, um, an executive committee there for their quality uh, uh, progress sustainability bonds, which now they've now done $7 billion uh, that they've issued from you know large corporations, really focused on, again, uh, you know sustainable uh, actions to bring more um, access to opportunity and equality in various segments of, of, of the economy, US economy. Um, and part of you know, the, the activities that I'm encouraged by is beyond what I call the advocacy is the action and the, act, you know, the action to support uh, systemic change at scale. Um, and I see it in some of the work that we're doing with you know, Student Freedom Initiative, uh, Southern Communities Initiative, some of the work uh, that I see, you know, other groups doing, um, and it's just important that everyone pushes and everyone thinks about making these changes at scales and not scale and not just focusing uh, ultimately on you know a, a narrow uh, area of interest, but but areas that actually hit broader elements of our of our economy and in our and I call our community as we relate to the economy. So, do I think that systemic change? can happen and will happen, yes. Um, the scale, the magnitude, the progress of which is to be determined, but I will tell you it's not gonna happen without the, the intentional actions of people like folks who are in this group uh, and us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're in a lot of rooms that others don't get access to, whether it's Davos or you know billion, millionaires, billionaires, and white allies and large institutions. So. I'm sure that just because of who you are, it doesn't necessarily make it any easier to affect change, but you can certainly influence uh, people and educate them and then ultimately hold them accountable. So there's, you know, what we find is that there's not, not everybody has made public commitments, but they're doing the work privately. And, uh, you know, is, is there any example that you could give where you've been in a room and you gave people an aha moment just by educating them on what you know and, and through your lived experience? Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. You know, it, it, again, making systemic change, like, like I said, it has to be intentional and you have to think about how you do it at scale. You know, we, we have now formed a new uh, partnership with the NACD and what, what are the, the, the things that, you know, we, we, we sit here uh, and say, wow, we don't have enough uh, people of color uh, on boards. And then you say, well, you know, and you, you, know, say, you know, large corporations go to the same 12 people to ask them to be on. <laughs> right. uh, and we saw that in prior generations. Um, and so we said, well, you know, I looked at my business in particular and give it a sense, you know, we have 80 plus companies in our portfolio, 85% of our companies have at least one person of color on, on the board. And uh, now I think it's 80 uh, have at least one woman on every board. We have two all female boards, but that doesn't happen unless you intentionally drive that activity. And I said, well, I sat back with my team and I said, well, here's the thing, you know, we're in a really interesting intersection of, 
you know, technology, software, and private equity. Private equity, you have the ability in a control position to actually influence and change, you know, the board composition. Okay. Uh, and, you know, traditionally, historically, it's, oh, you got to be in technology or software to be on these tech boards or software boards. I said, well, oh, every company needs someone to run the audit committee. Right. right. Okay. Every company needs somebody to run compensation committee. Every company needs somebody to run, you know, nominating committee. Uh, none of that necessarily has to do with whether or not you know about enterprise software or technology. So we formed this partnership with NACD, and now we have our first cohort going through. Uh, and what we're doing is we're, we're, we're finding partners who are, who are leaving kind of, you know, the, the big accounting firms. Remember, accounting firms, because of the rules, they, if they're partners, they can't necessarily sit on a board. Right, right. If they're leaving or have left, then we're going to, we are putting them through these training systems where they now become board eligible. So our projection, so first one is, you know, the audit committee, and then we're going to have two more flights and then probably two four her co cohorts per flight, audit committee, nominating committee, uh, compensation committee. And so in four years, we'll have 500 board eligible people who can now, if you think about a flood the zone, yes. for, uh, private companies, some of them will go public. Okay. And now, now when the public boards are saying, oh, we need to find some people of, you know, color, diversity to, to sit on our boards, well, they don't have a board experience. Well, yes, they do. They've already sat on at least one private board and maybe a, a number of them. So that's the, the dynamic that you get those aha moments. That's one yeah. of them. It's like, okay, so I'm talking to Chairman NACD and, and I said, look, why don't we build that? We can use our technology, our platform, uh, your content, because they do board readiness. Uh, and then we'll tap into the communities where these folks are naturally live, but can't access, right, they, these boards and, you yeah. know, that stage in their career, they're perfectly wonderful people and eligible to do this, but just now haven't had enough training and experience because their job prevented them from doing it. So anyway, that's one of those ways that you could actually make real change at size and at scale. And, you know, 500 new people, we should be able to, like I said, flood the zone that 10 years from now, we, we aren't calling on the same 12 people to sell on these public company mm -hmm. boards. We've okay. actually created a whole pipeline of board ready people. I mean, one of the, the, the beautiful things about you, and there are many, but one of them is, you know, how you think about solving big problems in a big way. And so what you were just describing to me is reflective of th this proof of concept that isn't small, right? It's a, it's a large proof of concept just saying there are people out there, we're going to work with you. And because you have the mind of, you know, an engineer, right, it, you know how to scale things. So I, th I think this is a really good opportunity to go to the next question in that, that's not the only thing you're doing. You're working on climate, you're working on tech talent, you're working on a lot of other initiatives around social justice and racial equality. Can you give everybody a, a room on how you're narrowing inequality gaps across your full body of work uh, and, and share with everybody you know, that information that they might not otherwise know? Sure, and, and again, thank you for, for saying those kind words uh, and, I, and I appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we so often um, do not really, you know, call it support and you and I, and I know you do, Andrea, you know, folks who are leading initiatives. So we should take the time uh, to help others who are driving these initiatives. You know, I, I just happen to have the good fortune of being able to do it from a platform that I have uh, capacity to make change uh, at scale. Um, you know, one of the, the, the things I'm, I'm focused on well, there's a few, but uh, let's just take, you know, within, call it the VISTA ecosystem, beyond the NACD uh, dynamic, and we'll be making this announcement shortly. I'm going to say it here, but, you know, it'll be announced in a minute. But, um, you know, 100% uh, of our companies have now signed up to have all of the greenhouse gases uh, wow. uh, and emissions measured, point number one, great. They've all now signed up to go through greenhouse gas emission um, uh, reductions. Um, and according to, you know, Paris Climate Accord. And then point number three, we will be the first private equity firm to offset all of the greenhouse gases from every one of our portfolio companies. And we're doing it in a unique way. And, you know, originally, you know, Vista has, as, as, as a company, has been, you know, carbon neutral for, for I think it's our third year. But I said, how do we get to now every portfolio company and then kind of at scale, you know, how do we now make sure that every company we buy uh, and then ultimately, 
you know, every company we, we have the opportunity to buy, we have a system to do it. So it's not episodic. Well, we found a group right. uh, that we've now partnered with where we are basically, you know, building and erecting solar arrays in underserved minority areas. So there's a couple of benefits. One, build the solar, solar arrays to actually offset the greenhouse gas is great. Two, we have the ability through this, this group to uh, onboard and train people in those communities uh, to not only, you know, be part of the construction, but also the maintenance of, of, of that. And then three, of course, you know, as we plug into the grids, it will actually be a lower uh, energy cost uh, for those in that community. So, you know, that again, that's a holistic and systemic approach for climate change that will affect all of our portfolio companies, again, at scale. So 90,000 employees should be feel proud uh, that we have that initiative. You know, we, we've got another initiative with uh, Southern Communities, um, where we picked, it's seven, we started off with six, but we added the Delta, uh, where we are building uh, infrastructure around these communities to address some inequities in banking, some of the inequities in uh, healthcare, some of the inequities in um, uh, access to broadband. Uh, and you know the other one on the list, I'll call it is, is uh, access to food, because each of these has kind of food deserts uh, as well as broadband deserts, banking deserts, et cetera. And so we have partnered, we've got uh, two good partners, one in BCG, one in PayPal. Uh, and now we've got a number of uh, uh, large corporations signing on for each of these communities. And we've also now partnered with, the, uh, with a community organization in each of those communities to enable us to deliver uh, capacity. Ah. Some of that capacity is like with the Grameen organization, which you know, Muhammad Yunus and the micro lending, and we've partnered them up basically with the NAACP and said, okay, you know, they've been doing, you know, $1 billion of micro lending, but not in African American communities. We said, fine, wow. let's bring that to our communities and create 400, 500, 600 small businesses in those six cities. So we've started wow. to pilot already. You know, we're you know, personally doing the funding in, in those, but that is going to create what I call the engine. The other thing is, you know, using some of our company's capacity, because uh, we're in technology to digitize uh, the uh, banks. And, you know, 70% of African American communities don't have uh, uh, branch banking access, but digitizing these, these banks gives them the ability to increase the volume and the capacity of lending. Small to medium, these are, you know, 10, 11,000, sometimes, you know, $20,000 business loans, commercial business loans to support, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, those businesses. And then, you know, building out some of our capacity to, to for small and medium business um, uh, software to enable them to transact more effectively and expand their businesses. So that's one. And then the Student Freedom Initiative focuses on affordable lending. And rather than students borrow money, get money or their parents and PPP loans, from the government paying back the government, uh, we've created a fund and now they borrow from that and then they pay back that fund. Uh, and, and say you decide, uh, and you're a STEM student, you decide, all right, I wanna go teach STEM in my neighborhood. You know, you do that for, I think it's 20 years, uh, that satisfies your payback requirement uh, as opposed to actually paying cash. But the whole point is we pay back in the fund, you actually have the ability to relend it to the next generation of students. So again, thinking about, and those are just a few of the initiatives, thinking about systems at scale that we feel uh, have the capacity to, to truly eliminate uh, systemic inequities uh, for broad you know, groups of our community. If you look at a hundred mile radius on each of those communities, we get to 50% of the African-American population. So that's why we did the study with BCG, figured out which communities, and that's, that's where we're starting. And now that's, that's the work we're doing. I mean, and this is in addition to your day job. So for those of you in the audience that are watching, this is, you know, he's one person. You, right. Obviously, you have a team and you have partners, but team, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, 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 the superpowers are just inspirational. Um, what well, it, tell, that, tell that, us. That's kind of to your point. You know, part of it is, um, you know, the platform. And so, you know, building companies of scale uh, like Vista enables us to do so many more things in our communities. I mean, we're one of the first, maybe I don't know, the only, I don't know, we're, well, not the only, but we're one of the first private equity firms is actually gender parity, right? 
and we've got 35% of our employees are people of color and another 15% after are underrepresented minorities. But, you know, part of it is if you have size and scale, you can put in programs and, you know, internships and to, to build pipeline because the way to solve it, a lot of these issues, because, uh, you know, yeah, you can try the normal way of, oh, go where this, you know, to the investment banks that, you know, that one person is getting 45 offers or you can start building your own pipeline which we decided to do years ago right and that's the stuff that creates the, the pipeline of people who now populate the ranks of our of our of our firm yeah i mean uh i think a perfect example of this you know we can't find any or there aren't a lot of or you know we're looking for this purple squirrel but imagine what if what if culture shift labs and vista equity partners had 500 purple squirrels i mean it's possible. Right, right. You can't yeah, just yeah. have 500 white purple squirrels that fit these roles and just assume right. that there aren't any black purple squirrels, right? You know, so, right, right. And, and a perfect example is, you know, Robert, we've known each other now for nine years. Yeah, probably, probably yeah. more than that, but yeah. And it was two weeks after uh, Culture Shift Labs won the Carnegie Hall contract that we introduced you to them. You ultimately, about a year later, year and a half later, became the chair of the board and gave them the largest programmatic gift they've ever gotten within that year. And we're talking about a 125 year old iconic arts institution. And you right. singly handedly have changed the trajectory of that organization. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. And they didn't know about you. Nobody on the board knew about you prior to that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's one example of many. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, you know, we, that's, you know, you, you have to have the engagements uh, with these institutions, be it a arts institution, uh, an investment bank, financial services, uh, you know, healthcare institution uh, in a way that says, you know, there, there are some, you know, there are some, some clear and distinct advantages uh, to introducing a broader aperture uh, in your evaluation of people who you want to come into, you know, come into your, into that ecosystem. You know, I look at now and a lot of work we're doing at Carnegie Hall, if you pick that one, I mean, we get to over 600,000 kids every year in our link up program. And, you know, and, and that, that otherwise didn't have music programs. They were taken out of their schools for most of reason, but now we provide that, that, that role. Um, we have the most diverse, you know, national youth orchestra, the most diverse, you know, youth orchestra in the world now. But th those are the things that come from that interaction and people being open to say, okay, you know, there there is value that comes in diversity, but I can't find these. People. Well, sometimes you have to create pipelines uh, for these people to solve the problem and you know and be systemic. And I really like to think about it as, you know, like all great solutions they involve touching all parts of the ecosystem as opposed to a narrow slice that you may engage with think about the entire ecosystem of education and training and and support and and and, and you know sustainability as elements of of what make a healthy ecosystem it's it's all interconnected it's like the body right yeah. when you think about human beings, what's inside of us is outside of us. And we're living in a world where sometimes you may not be able to see things, but it's all interconnected. And so you've got to think about it holistically. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. To your point, part of, the, you, you know, uh, Culture Shift Labs is to create a forum for people to get together and think about components of the work that they are doing and how, how it forms an ecosystem. You know, we started doing something in Fund2 Foundation called Cradle to Greatness. Because, okay, you can solve, you think you can solve a problem in K through 12 or, you know, at, at post high school, you know, or, or, you know, or graduate school, whatever. But the real issue is how do you connect all of these great programs? Mm -hmm. And I, I used to tell the people at Cornell, I said, you know, don't talk to me about retail solutions because they would all go to the same high schools and... <laughs> recruit the same three people and <laughs> well, they got nine offer or from every Ivy League school out there. We just missed them this time. And like, well, no, there's schools where there's thousands of kids that qualify to be at that university that have never heard of the university, to your point, or the university's never heard of them. Right. And so let's make that connectivity. Well, since we've done that, I look at Cornell, our engineering college has increased it's uh, African American underrepresented minority 6X since we started that program kind of seven years ago. 6X. 
right? And so those are the things that people in the room uh, should be focused on is how do I create connectivity and create ecosystem uh, solutions as a point as opposed to a point solution and let me take care of these four kids right uh, yeah oh, okay that's fine but what about the other 4,000 uh, who, who, who deserve those opportunities I hope at some point Robert you whether you write a book or a white paper or a thought leadership piece on um, encouraging leaders providing a roadmap on how leaders should think about solving problems in a bigger way from the seat that they sit at. Whether you're a VP of you know, global sales at Oracle, which is you know, where we're doing this chat from today uh, here in Silicon Valley, uh, or you're the CEO, or you're the chief diversity officer, I think people would appreciate applying a business solution to um, an opportunity that is lost on some people because they think, they think, that this is something that they'll do later because they have competing priorities. And the truth is, there's a war for talent. There's a talent shortage. Yeah. And that's a problem. So you better, you know, they better sort of put on their big boy, yeah. big girl panties and recognize that there's big ways to solve big yeah. problems. And, 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 you know, some of those ways are evident and obvious and some require some creativity. The beautiful thing about Silicon Valley is they're used to bringing creative solutions to complex problems. That's what we do. Uh, and, you know, one of our methods, size scale, that anyone in this room can do is, you know, like I tell my CEOs, whatever your internship program is, you know, triple it in size, right? Because right. right. there's no reason Think that, bigger. yeah, if you're taking three interns, take 10. If you're taking 10, take 40. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not tripling that, but you, you get the point, right? It's just increase the size and scale of your internship program, it, 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 it is the best way to win this war for talent, okay? That's what we do. And, you know, not to let all the secrets out, but what that does is give us, you know, multiple years to look at talented and capable people uh, and multiple years for them to look at us and the job and the job requirements and what we do. And, and, and you know, they get a better sense for our, our culture in our culture of excellence. So what does that actually mean? Not just words on a paper, uh, but ensuring that we can deliver, you know, highest returns, lowest loss ratios, kind of history of private equity. Well, because we focus on building our talent and our team uh, early in their careers and uh, actively manage their development. Right give them, you know, opportunities to excel and us opportunities with them to determine is this a good fit for you or not? Yeah. And if it is not, we're all better off learning that sooner as opposed to later. And if it is, let's develop you to be highly productive and successful in our organization. A absolutely. Absolutely. Of all of your projects, Robert, um, related to narrowing these inequality gaps, which is your favorite and why? <laughs> I, I don't have a favorite. Like is that, that like picking your favorite child? <laughs> you can't do that. They all have different levels of impact. Um, and, you know, they all address different parts of that ecosystem of solutions. You know, one cannot succeed without the other. I look at, you know, Suit Freedom Initiative. One of the things we're doing there is uh, create, creating digital infrastructure across all the HBCUs. Part of that is ensuring that they have uh, cybersecurity um, uh, protection. This is every one of them, every HBCU. We got, you know, partnering with Cisco Systems, for instance, mm. that enabled uh, us to, to be effective in this. It trains interns and enables their, their infrastructure and enables broadband access. Okay, well, with that, it creates extensible opportunities for, you know, those students, STEM students to now, you know, train for jobs and also gain access uh, to experiences for internships. And ultimately, that becomes extensible into the communities that they're in. For the small and medium businesses, I mean, it's all it's all an ecosystem, right? It and, is. Yeah. And engineers yeah. know that we need more yeah. engineers in problem solving <laughs> positions. Can you touch on the two percent solution? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, when you're going to talk about a systemic, this is one you know pushing uphill, but I think it's the right answer. You know, uh, today you look at the massive amount of uh, uh, economic productivity largest corporations in America have been able to generate for decades now. Uh, and the increasing um, kind of income and wealth disparities. And I say, well, look, look, just pick the area that you're in. If you're in telecom, take 2% of net income and drive it towards the elimination of the broadband gap and you know, access. You know, 40 million Americans 
uh, don't have access to broadband. And I look at my buddy, Makesh Ambani over in India, and he's got 480 million Indians on broadband and access, 1.3 billion have access to the geo networks, right? There's a whole bunch of reasons why, but, um, uh, you, know, you know, for us, there is no excuse. So if you're telecom, now you're working on, right? Great, all right, now if you're in, you know, food distribution, let's take 2% and build out, you know, distribution capacity. The neighborhood I grew up in still doesn't have a grocery store. Still doesn't have a branch bank. This is, you know, I'm, you know, in my late fifties, but still, right? So you look at those sort of things and you say, there's no reason that largest, you know, grocery distributors and and, and broadband distributors can't solve that problem in two percent of their income for ten years, which actually increases the overall. You eliminate that wealth gap. It's a right. one point five, uh, you know, trillion dollar pickup in GDP for the US, which in economies like this would be a good thing. Right? So, and, and it isn't like, and we found it isn't as if the fiber isn't already pulled or, but it's just an economic decision that's being made, say economic, you say racial, whatever it might be, but that that now can be solved through intentional activities and creative solutions to, to deliver, you know, high quality, um, high quality uh, infrastructure and service and support into these communities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we did a, uh, a fireside chat with Master P, Percy Miller, yeah. last year. And, you know, he was talking about, because he's been creating a lot of food products, and he partnered with a large grocery chain to look at, you know, food insecurity and creating, you know, neighborhoods that putting grocery stores, the right kinds of grocery stores in there. And I know he's, he's thinking about that. So there, there are people that are really trying. Um, yeah, you know, and, we and, got, and, that's, and, and he's a, a great guy, a great thinker. And I think one of the important things that we need to do is say, okay, let's take some of these models and bring them to scale. So we're not just in one community. You, you see what I mean? That's kind of, you know, if you think about our Southern Communities Initiative, it gets a half, half the African-American population through these, call it, you know, six cities and one other, you know, through the Delta communities. And all right, you know, everything from, you know, uh, especially today, what we're going to see with, with some of the, the, the food scarcity dynamics because of the supply chain shocks in the, in the war. Yes, well, you know, there's no reason we shouldn't expand everything from our, you know, distribution to community food um, uh, production, you know, community farming and all that sort of stuff. That, that, that stuff is all, you know, uh, 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 readily accessible today. It, it's really so that's what we need. Are you familiar with Michael Sorrell and the work that he's doing at his university and where he create he took the football field because they were doing so poorly and he created this farming community, this agriculture initiative? Yeah, yeah. Familiar with it yeah, gently, shall I say. I understand. I heard about it. And where's he's in Chicago, right? Or is it Overland? Is that one? I forget yeah. where Michael Sorrell is, but you know, he's a real innovator in that way. You know, obviously solving a problem in a particular community, but it, it certainly can scale. Um, we, we, we're almost out of time. We have about 10 minutes left together, Robert, and um, um, two more questions for you. What do you believe is needed, efforts, initiatives, collaborations, et cetera, that you don't yet see happening? Ah, it's a great thought. Um, I think we, um, to, to me, Today, I think the access to educational opportunities that are affordable uh, is one of the critical things that our you know, government should really, really address. Uh, and I'm not saying education should be free for all, but it should be accessible that's affordable, which means as you come out, you're not burdened by debt the way that you can't create wealth in your family. Because uh, I think that dampens optimism and hope, right? So that's kind of one of the big areas that needs some work. Uh, the other area, and I, I call it stroke of a pen, literally should be the digitization of every, you know, CDFI and MDI. These are the, you know, capillary banking systems. Uh, because if you digitize them, it creates, an, it creates a, a higher efficacy of their ability to bring capital into their communities that they uniquely know. Right. Uh, and, you know, if you have a, you know, barbershop hair salon getting an extra chair, you have a restaurant, you know, adding an extra five tables or, you know, the ability to, to produce more food to, to do for curbside delivery, whatever. I mean, those are the things that matter because it's those businesses that hire people and support communities and create 
you know, economic uplift and jobs and internships and nighttime jobs and all those sort of things that really make a community strong. And when communities are economically strong, they become, uh -huh, surprise, surprise, safe. Uh, <laughs> no right. So those are the things that I that I that I'd point to. You know, we can point to kind of the health the healthcare disparities, which are huge in this country. Those can actually be solved uh, through telemedicine uh, if you have broadband, right? So I mean, you know, again, this is ecosystem. You got to solve some of the problems so that so it works. Uh, listen, if you can put a cell phone in the hands of a Maasai warrior who's doing some farming and, you know, on, on the continent of Africa, yeah. we could do a lot more here if people just pause, zoom out and rethink old systems that are not serving everybody. And why wouldn't you want your citizens, your er, the earthlings, people of, you know, the, the states particularly um, to have access and opportunity because it trickles down in so many areas. Oh, it creates huge, yeah, it creates huge economic uplift and stability and optimism. And, you know, and it gives us all what I call, you know, a, a, a reason uh, to, 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 you know, lean forward into the future as opposed to, you know, feel afraid of the, the present. Yeah, I mean, we will create a better working world if, if leaders just listen to what you had to say. And we're going to share this, obvious, this video is being shared with hundreds of people in the room today. Um, but, you know, I know you want to create a better working world, and I know that you get pinged a lot to donate here and support there, and you do. Cancer research, and there's so much more that you didn't cover, Robert, because you probably don't remember. But I know <laughs> <laughs> I watch you because I'm inspired by you, and it allows me to, when I get stuck and frustrated, the road is long and hard as an entrepreneur. I listen to you and I get inspired to keep going. So I know there's a lot more that you're doing, but I remember listening to you. We were sitting together at the Cup Gala when you were honored and mm -hmm. you said something that struck me. You said, you don't have to be Robert Smith to be a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. Before I ask you this last question, could you touch on what that means? Yeah, I mean, any person, anytime, anywhere. You know, I, I was just on what I said, my, my Morehouse class and we talk about that, you know, work-life balance or two years out, three years out, figuring out. I said, listen, you know, sometimes you just got to go spot the inequities and some inequities are reading to a child down the street whose parent is working, doesn't get home or, you you know, for, you know, you, you should take on that role or, you know, help uh, to send some single parent with some of the work on the weekends. And, and those things are fulfilling and rewarding. Um, and in for the Morehouse class, I'm saying, okay, some of you know a lot about finance and you know nothing. So guess what? Now they have formed a, an investment club and, you know, teaching and training and about wealth, wealth creation. That's, to me, that's kind of what it's about. So, you know, what you can, what you can do to be helpful to your community and, and go do that. In some cases, it's one kid at a time. Some cases you can do, you know, 10 businesses at a time. It depends on what your skill set is relative to your community. Right, right. You know, what, what, to touch on uh, what I was saying a little bit earlier is, you know, you get pinged a lot, and I know you support a lot of things, but at the same time, I'm sure sitting in the room, listening to the pitches and reading the grant requests and the problems people are solving got you to think, how do I create solutions at scale, which is what you ultimately ended up doing. Does that sound about accurate? So you say, let me take the ball and, and create sort of bigger solutions support the organizations where I can, and then think about how I can sort of take ownership of creating yeah, the I, I just, Yeah, I just kind of think about, you know, how do you do things again uh, so that they're sustainable? Um, I'm not a person who, you know, focuses on what I call episodic um, solutions. You know, you really, you know, every now and then it's, you know, it's, a, it's the, you know, classic parable about, you know, the two villagers walking upstream and they look and there's some baby, a baby floating downstream and another one and a few more start floating downstream and one of them jumps in the river and starts pulling babies out and the other one starts running. The other guy's like, what are you doing? Aren't you helping me? He said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to run upstream and figure out why the baby's getting thrown in the water. Right. <laughs> and there's not to say that one's more valuable than the other, but you know, you, you've got to figure out in some cases, yeah. Okay. You go save that baby. In some cases you run upstream, but the real answer is get more people, to help in both, <laughs> right? So, right. What did uh? There was somebody that once said to me, I don't know. I think it was a civil rights leader. You need tree shakers and jelly makers. So, yeah. um, absolutely. So, my last question to you is, what is your call to action to everybody in this room? Yeah, it's that you know, either go pull babies out of the stream or run upstream, but do something, <laughs> right? Now, that's kind of what it is. Do something and figure out, uh, you know, the the brilliance in that room. 
uh, should very much think about systemic approaches uh, to solving some of these inequities as opposed to episodic engagement. But there are gonna be some people who, who you engage with that you should encourage to do episodic engagement because that's what they uh, uh, can do. But everybody should do something. You know, either run in the stream and go grab a baby or start running upstream and start, you know, start uh, figuring out why they're going in the water. Right, and don't wait until you, you know, one day when I get here and there, you can do something right now from the seat that you sit at. Robert, you know, thank you for um, all that you do. And I don't know how you make 48 hours in a day, but you do. And uh, sometimes you make it look easy, but I know it's not even just tackling the 24 hours in a day. Uh, thank you for supporting Culture Shifting Weekends as a multi-year, multi-market partner and for just all that you do to uplift um, this world. Well, thank you for taking the lead uh, with uh, Culture sh Shifting Labs. And, you know, and it's an important part of that is these weekend, weekends, these convenings, uh, and, and literally getting people to think, think differently, call to action, and, and then, you know, make sure that action is sustainable. For, so for thanks, thanks for all you do. Thank you. And please give my regards to your beautiful wife and your lovely family. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. All the best. Take care.